Hey there, and welcome to another exciting episode of A Weeks Out TV. I'm your host, Joel Jamison, along with Howie Clark. How you doing, Howie? I'm doing good. You? Nice. I'm excited for today's show. Um, we've got a great topic, and that's nutrition, and real specifically, you know, nutrition for athletic performance. And uh, I know you've tried a lot of different diets over the years, being an athlete yourself. Yeah, definitely. I'm really excited to hear what Kiefer has to say, and uh, uh, I've read his uh, Carb Night Solution and Carb Backloading and, and tried it myself. So. Uh, It'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the, the questions you come up with for him. Yeah, exactly. As Howie said, we have today's guest is Kiefer of Carb Backloading and Carb Night fame. And then we've also got a really cool roundtable discussion we put together with um, a few of us, including James Fitzgerald and Mark McLaughlin. And we just wanted to kind of dive into the topic of nutrition and talk about how to improve your performance and, and what guys are doing out there. So I'm excited to see what these guys have to say. Yeah, definitely a wealth of knowledge. Um, and, 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 you know, that's the one thing about nutrition is there's, there's no one way to do it. And so uh, uh, just knowing uh, the roundtable discussion, I think we're going to probably find out that it's, uh, it's all about individualizing it and uh, kind of getting it to suit your individual goals. Absolutely. So let's get started. Let's hear what uh, Kiefer has to say about nutrition and uh, get into his backloading and carb night solution. All right, why don't you start uh, by just giving us a little bit of background about yourself. I know you're the, you're the carb backloading guy and, and you're, yeah. you're most well known for that. So for, for people who aren't familiar with carb backloading and, and kind of your take on nutrition, can you just give us a quick rundown on, on what you're all about? Uh, the quick rundown is, I mean, basically uh, cyclic ketogenic diets. And so the first one I had was carb night, which actually is no carbs all week and then just a lot of carbs one night a week. And then the latest is carb backloading, where I figured out how you can actually have a shit ton of carbs every night. Sounds uh, like a good plan. Yeah. Yeah, you just, it requires training. It's one of the first diets I know that's really integrated heavily with your training schedule, um, at, at least from an aesthetic point of view. How does, this, this is a personal question, how does the carb night stuff differ from the old body open stuff that Duchesne made popular? Uh, it, it's actually just a refined version. Uh, that's what I keep trying to explain to people. It's not not magic or anything new as far as that. It was just science had finally come around and was available to refine it at a really high level. Like you can close the window down for how long you eat carbs because you only need an insulin spike for six to eight hours. Uh, and we know that you need high glycemic carbs because if insulin gets so high, then it shuts off the fat cells ability to release fat. But if you crest a certain, certain threshold, then your fat cells will start dumping fat again. So, you know, we just have all this science to really refine it and actually encourage people to eat crap that they weren't always encouraged. To. Well, I, I remember the Body Opus diet in college. I'd go down to the ice cream store and I'd literally pound gallons of ice cream, ice cream and pizza, yeah. ice cream and pizza in the car yeah. the weekend. It was awesome. He, yeah, I mean, for somebody who didn't have access to the modern research, that was pretty far along. Oh he yeah, was I mean, pretty advanced. Yeah, he was definitely a leader. Now, how did you, how did you kind of go from that? concept or you know refining the old body opus type model to to carb backloading in that that diet uh so carb night you know i love it because it's easy to stay lean and hold on to all your muscle but i couldn't really gain muscle while i was on that diet um i just i plateaued and i plateaued at a low body weight that i didn't like uh, and then i just i'd read some research on diabetics and their ability to clear blood sugar even though their cells remained uh insulin insensitive so they were insulin resistant but they could still clear blood sugar and it just kind of put the pieces together for me and that happened because of resistance training so I was like well if you don't eat carbs all day you should be able to stay ketogenic burn a lot of body fat and then resistance train and then have these huge insulin spikes at night that basically accelerate your fat burning and reload your muscles with glycogen and give you all the recovery and growth benefits of insulin you should be able to stay lean and, and grow and uh so I put it out there, and it basically worked wonders for everybody that's done it. So, so, so carb backloading is it more for people who want to build muscle. Is it can it be used for fat loss? I mean, what's the the primary? Yeah. So it really whether you're going to use it for muscle gain or fat loss only depends on how you load your calories through the day, and it's really that first half of the day that'll determine if you're going to gain or if you're going to lose. So, the first half you go into a caloric deficit, then you're going to stay really tight. You're going to lose a lot of body fat. And keep your muscle mass 
uh, if you go high, high caloric load during that first half of the day, then you're going to build muscle and stay lean. Uh, how do you think the diet can be applied, or do you think it can be applied to more of an athletic you know, type thing for, for fighters that are training hard or other athletes? I mean, do you see a role for that sort of approach, or do you, do you think it needs to be modified? Uh, I think there's definitely a role for that approach. The, the question would have to look at uh, on an individual basis, like how good are they at recomping their glycogen stores? Um, how well do they adjust to doing that kind of power production without carbs? Some people do incredibly well, some people don't. Um, and then also they just might have too large of a workload to, to refill. So then you'd have to do something like, which I haven't talked about a lot, but glycemic backloading. So you kind of stage how you introduce the glycemic load through the day. Yeah, so I mean like... So the same, same principles would be at work, but the structure would be different. So like, let's, let's say for example, like, uh, you know, my fighters come in the mornings, they do their strength conditioning with me, and then they have a break of four to five hours, and then they come back in the evenings to do their MMA skill work. And so, you know, my work is obviously, can be very intensive or it can be more endurance based depending on the day, but they're spending, you know, a good amount of time depleting glycogen and then they have to go back next door and, you know, be able to have the energy to train intensely as well. So, you know, I guess, what would be your take on, on how that would be approached? I mean, because most guys now, I mean, there's, there's just kind of the, either the, the guy pays no attention to his diet whatsoever, you know, or the right. guy that reads some article or, or thinks, you know, he knows how to apply it, but it's very unscientific. So. And what, what would your take be on that? It's kind of a great situation. If you're getting uh, first thing in the morning, if you can adjust to train in um, a non-carb state, so you could eat some food, but it'd be heavy fat load, um, train, and then there's research to show that you get a larger recovery rate and um, growth rate strength increase by having carbs immediately after that morning workout if you haven't had any carbs before. So you could actually double the signaling of normal. Uh, with that carb load. And then in the middle, you would again, no carbs, carb deplete. You'd probably have some stores, just more of an insulin spike is what you're looking for in the morning. And then at night you have your training. My question would be, you've got that, that resistance work session, basically strength conditioning. After that is when I would load up with carbs and that, that would be tuned to eating carbs that would produce the insulin spike, but would also aptly fill up the glycogen store. So they're ready for the next day's training. Cause the insulin's for immediately after the training, all the carbs are for the next day's training. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I've, I've read a lot of research lately that looks at kind of how the, you know, how the body knows whether, whether you're overtraining or, or whether you're not, and it's a chronically depleted glycogen um, state that tends to signal the brain that something's going wrong here. So, mm -hmm. you know, especially if these guys are training two and sometimes three times a day, if they're chronically running low on, on glycogen, and they're starting to send that signal that, hey, something is wrong here, and I think that's part of what triggers the body to you know, shift more into a going overtrained state. So yeah. are there any specifics, you know, as far as the kind of carbs, the amount of carbs, uh, you know, you think would be appropriate for, for making sure it doesn't happen? Uh, again, it's, it's going to be, I, I usually base it on body weight. I usually put people through a depletion phase for 10 days, and then I can see exactly what their base carbohydrate stores are. And then if you go through this cyclic ketogenic and you you spend a couple days without carbs, you can actually get super compensation of about 50 to almost double the normal storage. Um, so that's what I would base it off of to make sure that you're always refilling and that you try to keep the athlete in the range of being super compensated. So what about, what about type of carb? Would you have a Oh, the type of carbs, that? as simple sugars are great. Uh, even the fructose, cause you've got most normal people should stay away from fructose, but for athletes, I mean, their liver glycogen is being depleted as well, which fructose is incredibly apt at restoring that. And then the other half, the glucose molecule is helping to restore glycogen stores in the muscle. Have you seen, um, I talked to Anthony, uh, what's his name, the guy who found EAS? Um, oh, um, EAS. Anthony Almada. EAS. Anthony Almada. Uh, anyway, Anthony Almada and I've communicated a little bit and, and he has a product, Vitargo. I don't know if you've seen that, but there's some research on Vitargo basically speeding up glycogen resynthesis. We play around with that I, a little bit. I, yeah, I've seen the car, but I haven't had a chance to play around with it yet. Yeah, I mean, we, but people have, yeah, people have pinged me about it. Hey, do you think this would be great for car back? Yeah, let me ask you, because he, he was talking about, um, what's the one, waxy maze that a lot of people use, and he basically yeah. said that he thinks that's junk for carb uh, or glycogen resynthesis. Do you have any thoughts on that? See, well, you know, waxy maze is mostly amylopectin which actually is structured almost exactly like human glycogen, which is one reason that amylopectin is so good at restoring glycogen stores. So, 
I'm not sure what the disconnect there. Yeah, I don't know. He had, um, he had some reasons. I don't remember exactly. He said they were fairly. It's actually a free low glycemic carb that he thought didn't refill as well. But well, yeah, I know amylos is like that. Amylos is kind of low glycemic and doesn't restore glycogen stores as well. But amylopectin is the wax, waxy one. So like purple potatoes have that real waxy feel. They have a higher amylopectin content to them. Yeah. And as far as you know, are there any other supplements that you you know think could be important for fires or fires, or maybe supplements you'd stay away from if oh, you're a fighter, I guess. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, you know, there's, there's interesting things like caffeine would, I think, be a good supplement for one because you can super compensate creatine phosphate levels in muscles with caffeine, um, which I would think would have a huge advantage with your power burst that you need in the ring sure. and you're fighting. Uh, other than that, just making sure you've got like a good multivitamin mineral. I mean, if those things get out of balance, you're shit out of luck. Making sure your salt content is good. Maybe if you drink a lot of um, bottled water, things like that, a little bit of sea salt every day keeps all that in balance. What about fish oil? Oh, of course. Sorry. I wouldn't even think <laughs> about that one because that's just kind of the standard yeah, staple. Yeah, I mean. Do you have any, you have any recommendations in terms of how much? Because I've seen dosing all over the place. Some guys say, you know, very high levels of fish oil will be actually uh, blood thinning and can be pro-inflammatory and too little obviously has had a little effect. So what do, what do you think is a good, um, a good balance? Uh, kind of you caught me at a, a dearth of the information. I believe it's, it, I call it super dosing because in this, the research, you get maximum benefit with man, minimum downside, I think around 20 grams a day of actual, of the, um, of the omega-3 oil. So that comes out to like 25 grams of actual fish oil. Makes sense. But that increases anabolic signaling in the cells, yeah, nutrient throughput, yeah. I mean, so that's kind of where you should be looking at. Yeah, what about just out of curiosity, I've, I've played around a lot with nootropics, with fighters in particular, you know, have a lot of fast reaction times and being able to process that information. So we've played around with, you know, pure sedum and hydrogen, uh, you know, blanking, um, sledgeline, depranil. Yeah. You know, the choline and stuff like that. Is, yeah, yeah, the Alpha GPC actually yeah. they use quite a bit and, and kind of parameter seed them the newest one. But have you played around with any of the topic really. stuff? I'm glad yeah. Yeah, how's, how's it work? It works well. I mean, the, the problem is, I wouldn't say the problem, but the, the biggest challenge is it's like anything else. It's a very individualized response because now you're talking about brain chemistry. Right. Right. So yeah. every, everybody responds very differently in, in my experience to them. So if you have the right dose response and you have the right combination, you see a big improvement in reaction time, you see passive recovery, you know, you see all these things happen. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you can either see very little improvement or you can see things get worse. So I always play around kind of yeah. way off season where the guys can experience right. and start basic and, and build out. But I think it's honestly, in my opinion, one of the, you know, the under discussed yeah. areas of performance because the brain is the central governor right. of everything, right. and if we can take stuff to increase oxygenation in the brain or cerebral function, right. we can signaling speed up. all the way down the yeah exactly. So, I mean, people don't realize that that signaling is not actually electrical; it's mostly chemical from from cell to cell. So, there's some efficiency things there that oh, yeah. you can play with. And like we were talking about before, yeah. if you can increase oxygenation of the brain, you can prevent not prevent, but you can at least delay fatigue right. because the brain's going to have more oxygen. Right. Which um, was an interesting conversation everybody missed. Yeah, we'll Sorry talk about, about that, that later. Um, next thing, what, I would say one of the challenges with, with most fighters is making weight, right? I mean, they have to drop, you know, anywhere from five to 20 pounds to make weight. They have to weigh in usually four or five o'clock on, you know, Friday typically, fight on Saturday. You know, they're dealing with the travel stress. They're dealing with the, just the overall mental workload and stress of stepping right. in front of the million people and fighting. You know, so there's, there's a lot that goes into that, that weight cut and that making weight. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, what you would do if you were going to have a master plan and tell someone what to do and how to do it as far as making weight? If I were going to have a master plan for making weight and overall performance being a concern, um, I kind of have this, this standard diet that I've refined for di lots of different types of athletes who need to make, make weight. And essentially at its base, you start, you know, seven to 10 days out and you strip carbs out of the diet because that works nicely because usually that's a deload week before the fight or whatever's coming up. Uh, so you strip carbs out of the diet and then about five days out, you start drinking a lot of water. Um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't start as distilled water. You drink, um, like say the first day you're up to four liters, next day six liters, next day eight liters, and then you'll hold eight liters until say Thursday night. Thursday, you're gonna try to get in as much water as you can before 5 p.m. 
after that, you're gonna wait about two hours and then you're actually going to ingest some sort of fatty meat or something and then really dry carbs. Uh, what works for a lot of people that I, I work with are either Rice Krispie treats or graham crackers, depending on if they've got gluten problems or not. And that gets, flushes the rest of the water out of your body, um, actually makes you really tight, makes it surprisingly hard to hold water even though you're trying to replenish glycogen. Um, you just, the glucose works as a diuretic first. So you get really dry. And then in some cases, depending on the athlete, I'll actually have them take a couple shots of alcohol beforehand, which dries them out over through the rest of the night. The next day, they're gonna be really tight, usually very easy to make weight. Um, and then recomping after that is again, starting with I don't know, it's like sea salt added to milk. Milk is incredibly good at uh, recompositioning electrolytes, mineral content, and it it holds, it makes everything hold later, I found. You know, you get the minerals back in balance, and then as you recomp with um, anything from bananas to uh, Pedialyte to whatever to just fill things back up and keep your protein content and fat levels decent through there, and I would use MCTs. Uh, they get into the bloodstream fast, they fill the muscles up fast. You're basically recompensating and super compensating all of your energy stores uh, you want to try to get that in, in as much as possible that night of your weigh-in so that the next day you have time to adjust to that load and then you're ready to go for the fight. Would you have any particulars as far as fight day itself as far as what you would eat or wouldn't eat? I mean, I've always found that the guys, I want to always make sure the guys aren't eating something they're not used to. It's, right. I want to make it something that they regularly incorporate in their diet so they're yeah. not all of a sudden like, what's going on? Yeah, so. exactly. Like that's, that's the nice thing about fighters because they have that whole day. They can go back to whatever their standard diet is that they're used to having before sparring practice or whatever it is that they know works best for them. Yeah, exactly. Because the last thing you want to do is have yeah. poor digestion Throw, in the day yeah, of the fight and, right. and be all over the that's place. That's why it's that night, that night of, it's great to use just really simple carbs that like just get in, get absorbed. And the milk and the sea salt really help because that just keeps you from getting upset stomachs or in, nasty intestinal stuff. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts on the actual cut itself of, you know, the traditional has been the sauna or exercise and <laughs> lately some people have been doing uh, salt baths and, and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. Do you have any thoughts on that? It works. That's, that's what I consider last ditch, uh, last uh, resort. You know, if you didn't, you should be able to plan appropriately to make weight without resorting to those kind of things. I mean, sometimes you have to, but probably the salt bath is the least performance decreasing of the methods. I mean, I've seen guys go into the steam sauna and when they get out of there, you know, they've made weight, but they're cramping for the next 12 hours. Um, so, I mean, it's just, that's desperation. If, if you're in that position, you might already need to be thinking about a new strategy for the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any, any guidelines as far as, I mean, Let's say you're fighting at 185, I mean, the week of the fight, let's say seven days out, I mean, what, what do you think is a safe range? Where should guys stay in so they can safely and effectively drop one, I, I one week I put in out? the safe range is 10%. 10% you should, for somebody who's decently lean, you know, got a good muscular frame, you should be able to drop 10% of your body weight easily, recomp it. The week of the fight? 12, yeah. So basically 185, they're going low 200s. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably about what we've what we found over the years is somewhere in that range, you know, depending on the weight class, but. Right, anything more than that, you start getting into performance problems. Yeah, this is a random question, but uh, you know, one of the things we see in chronic overload is, is a, you know, a repetitive inflammatory response because every time you train, you're, you're increasing cytokine production, you're increasing the inflammation. So do you have any thoughts on, on how to use diet or supplements or anything to, to make sure that doesn't become, you know, go from, doesn't go from acute inflammation to chronic inflammation, which again, signals the brain and triggers, triggers a lot of bad stuff. Right, yeah. Uh, inflammation, of course, like great hormetic response. You need it because that triggers a lot of adaptive responses too much. Of course, then you wipe out all the adaptive responses that you just got. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so diet, I, I mean, that's one reason I think carb backloading is working for a lot of people is those huge insulin spikes are decreasing the amount of inflammation almost immediately. And then you're keeping energy stores high that basically allow your body to stay at a nice energy balance the whole time, which prevents chronic inflammation. And then you've also got, I mean, I recommend sometimes up to 50 grams of creatine for some athletes. 50 day, grams, really? 50 grams, because it's, it's a powerful anti-inflammatory and an, uh, it's an antioxidant. So it again helps them to recover in some cases. That's, that's not normal, but you know, I've taken people up to that 
Well, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? I know I've read uh, a few papers where they looked at just vitamin C and they're looking at aerobically trained athletes. They found, uh, I think it was a fairly moderate dose, like two grams of vitamin C actually decreased aerobic adaptation. Because really? there, yeah, because there was decreased, it was too it, was, it decreased the ROS production, the oxidant production, and let, lessened the signaling basically back to the athletes. That so it's sense. tricky to find, you know, like I said, we right. want some signaling, but if we totally mute that with a bunch of stuff that right. negates the response, then yeah. we tend to decrease signaling. So right. it's, it's yeah, a tricky why, balance. Yeah. It seems like during training, uh, I know a lot of guys will introduce a lot of carbohydrates during the training session. I always try to encourage them to give like a 30 or 45 minute window from the start of training to before they start spiking insulin, just to make sure they get that hormetic response and get that inflammatory reaction that will cause the reaction they're looking for, which is muscle growth or endurance or whatever it is their target is. Yeah, you know, I saw there's. Another interesting thing I was reading where they were looking at uh, just aerobic endurance stuff and aerobic power on very low carb or carb depleted, and what they found was that it increased uh, mitochondrial enzymes and aerobic enzymes, but somehow that didn't translate into performance because when they actually looked at performance tests, there was almost no difference. So I think part of the thing is you're stimulating it, but your training is reduced because you don't have the glycogen, right. and so your overall stimulus becomes less, and so you see this weird kind of balance. I've always tried to think of how to try and minimize out some sort of depleted cycling or some way to, to minimize that Or how downside. do you take advantage of it? Yes, you get exactly. that regulation and then get a rebound effect that yes. would, like spike your injuries. Yeah, so there's got to be some way to, to manage that. I've always... We should figure that out. Well, we should. Because <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure we could. Yeah, what, uh, speaking of that, what are, you, what are you working on these days? What's, what's new? Um, nothing too incredibly new. Just uh, bringing out some information that's been sitting around for a little bit that's finally ready. Uh, some card, <laughs> some uh, cardio stuff, some uh, new diet updates. There's been some new research that's been really interesting, and um, actually, I've been kind of leaning towards the helping diabetics a little bit. Some doctors have been using my diets in clinical st uh, settings. And they're getting their their patients off of cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, everything. So. It's, it's kind of this interesting shift where I'm, I'm still servicing the performance community and now I'm starting to look at the health health community as well. Hmm. Well, why don't you tell, her, tell her everybody where they can find you and, and get more information about what you've um, got. I'm, but all my main information and basically the portal to everything I do from YouTube to podcasts, even the podcast with Joel's on there, uh, you can find it all through my site, dangerouslyhardcore.com. Yeah, thanks, great information and uh, you know, people should check it out. And welcome back. Uh, thanks again to Kiefer for doing that interview with us. Uh, really interesting to get some different ideas and thoughts of, of how he would take his, his backloading and his carb-based approach or a carb backloading approach towards athletics and, and fighting. Um, to get some more discussion going and, and some ideas on nutrition and athletics performance, I brought in a couple other experts and friends of mine to talk about how they approach nutrition, you know, what they do as far as uh, diet and supplements with their athletes. Um, so of course I have Howie with me. Um, then we've added James Fitzgerald, who was the 2007, yep. 2007 CrossFit Games champion, the first one out there. And then Mark McLaughlin from the PTC Performance Train Center down in uh, Portland, Oregon. So thanks to you guys for coming on. And uh, let's get the conversation started. Let's just kind of want to get a brief maybe overview of, of what you guys do or don't do, you know, as far as nutrition with your athletes. Going, I know it's kind of a sensitive subject. Different states have different regulations as far as what you can and can't prescribe. Um, so do you I have wasn't a? Aware of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> now, now you are. <laughs> He's a Canadian. <laughs> they, they need to, well, there you go. There's my first point. Uh, first point of my prescription. There may be some losses. I just changed my prescription. prescription. <laughs> <laughs> Based on what I can and cannot do. How about you start thinking? Yeah. I'll realize what I can't do. In Arizona. I don't know about Arizona. But Since okay. I work uh, mostly with uh, high school athletes, I have to get them to realize that there's more than one food group outside of a donut. Um, so, you know, with the nutrition that I do, which is very limited, is just making sure that they're consuming enough calories throughout the day. And then also on the supplementation, I mean, it's, you know, it's non-existent just because it's like, okay, you guys need to train right first. And then as you get older, you know, then the diet can, you know, come into play a little bit more. So 
I mean, I imagine parents' education is a big thing as well, just getting the parents to understand the importance of making sure their kids are having the right foods. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, teaching them, or not teaching them, but, you know, get them to educate themselves, you know, on what's, you know, good health choices for themselves, and then that kind of spills over into the kids, so. Wouldn't, wouldn't even, you know, supplementation, just speaking of that, like, yeah. if the diet's not in order and you're taking supplements, is is that a waste of money or is, I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I'm... Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. It's not just for the high school athlete. It's for um, everyone on a day-to-day -day basis that if you don't have the, the best nutritional, you know, prescription relative to what your function is, relative to what you want to do. So if you don't have that in place, then I don't think you deserve actually to supplement. Um, and if you are supplementing, um, then I'd, I'd want to fix the pieces that you don't have within your nutrition first before we look at what's required based upon supplementation. Supplementation is a supplement of exactly. what a food would be. So if people don't have that, especially for high school athletes or anyone in general for fitness, then um, yeah. But I see how easy it is though to, to kind of go towards that route because it looks like the next step in like, oh, that's going to help me do this. Nope. But <clears throat> unless you know you have a coach who really embodies that or understands it, uh, then supplementation will be be foremost uh, until you get real good nutrition and see that wow you know by eating like that I can train and, and provide you know do the kind of things I want to do you'll never see it you'll never understand yeah you know I you think know. something else you know, we've always talked about the importance of individualizing the training yeah. and I think that's get lost in the diet realm too because mm -hmm. just like not everyone's gonna respond the same to a training program not everybody should be on the same type of diet even yeah. if they're in the same sport you know there's people respond differently to different food people some people do well in low carb some people don't I mean it, again, it comes down to the individual response to training and, you know, how you're going to respond. Um, you know, just because somebody else does well on diet doesn't mean that you're going to or, or this athlete's going to as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, dealing with, you know, adults, like, you know, what's going to work for me is totally different than, you know, what, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old high school, you know, athlete, you know, needs. And, you know, what they don't understand is, you know, okay, can they get up? in the morning to have breakfast early enough or are they just kind of rushing out and grabbing a pop tart or something like that and then when they get to the gym and you ask them you know why they're so fatigued they're like well you know i've had one pop tart a donut and a piece of pizza mm -hmm. it's like okay yeah and that's where the learning occurs is to allow them to realize okay well that's just what you did do you see how that's not the way that it's going to be able to work for yeah. us to still provide or, or yeah. perform you know and then letting them go through a workout in that yeah. state to yeah. you know realize themselves okay yeah i need to maybe make some changes um the training part is always the easiest mm -hmm. it's getting them to do the things outside of that yeah. arena yeah. where they can see the biggest improvements. Yeah, I think picking on the, that point though, there's where the magic is because when people can see that the nutritional pieces lead into good training, then that's when they get, that's where the magic is. Because if, if you get a genetically talented individual, and especially for kids, they, they can run off sugar because number one, their gut's super resilient. Uh, number two, they're just firing all the time. So they're basically on a glucose drip all day. Um, and if they, they can operate like that and still be talented, they'll go into, I mean, we've seen it in professional athletes that are 30 oh, yeah. years old and eat like shit. Oh, but, I mean, but they're so talented yep. that that overrides what they need. And if all they get is just sugars to allow them to perform, then that's fine. So, and they really don't give a crap about where they're going to be when they're 55. So how do you, you know, there's, there's a shit storm in there because then that athlete is then being seen by those young kids. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, look at him. I mean, he's yeah. having Subway and Coke, you know, um, mid, mid, mid-game, so maybe that's things I can do too. Yeah. So the magic has to occur with good nutrition, so the kid goes, or the, or the adult goes, now that was a good training week. There you go, it's because we ate that way, it's because you manage blood sugars, because you slept well, yep. you know. I mean, I've literally seen, I mean, you can probably talk about it in baseball since you've worked with oh, yeah. baseball your whole life, and I've literally seen somebody win an NFL MVP and win, uh, you know, set the rushing record for touchdowns, eating Doritos and Mountain Dew, mm -hmm. you know, before games. Yeah. And kids see that and they think, oh, well, yeah. if he can do that and be the highest level I can, then, the reality is, you know, genetics can make up for a lot of it, and you can, yep. you can succeed despite your training, not because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Those, Those are that. the exceptions, yeah. right? I mean, there's always yeah. exceptions and everything, but I was, I was always more curious that everyone always wants the perfect diet. You know, they want the diet that's gonna be the best for your health, uh, to get you the leanest, to put on the most muscle and perform the best, mm -hmm. and those are probably four different prescriptions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's, it, it always seems like everyone wants that one specific thing, but it's got to be individualized, you know, yeah, the, the, the more information you have about that one person, you can cater it and yeah, get that, that right, right protocol. protocol. And it's going to take some time. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's, it's well, the, the question that I have for someone who says that is, uh, what's the purpose behind you wanting to change your diet? So what are you currently doing right now? Do you think that this new book or prescription is gonna make a difference on it? Um, and then the education component based upon you know, what, what those changes are going to do. Because maybe if you ask a little bit more questions, they're not willing to put in the time that's required in order to do that. Therefore, you're just barking up a tree by making a prescription and giving this fancy diet that they're not even gonna follow. So it's a behavior modification issue. It's not you know, the diet itself as such. Um, and teaching coaches who try to teach that to people, our first lesson is the life coaching piece, and then it's nutritional prescription, because then it's just a scientific, scientific piece. But individuality is key based upon things I'd mentioned earlier of the resiliency of the person. So some people can't use proteins the way other people can. Some people can't have dairy. Some people can't have gluten. So my question is always, well, don't beat on dairy, gluten, and those other things, and, and don't write books about it and create drama around it. You should be asking, why can't that person handle that? Um, and no one seems to ask that question. Um, it's got to do with the resiliency piece, I think, in terms of like their total system, sleep, water, sunshine, all those things. Because there's some people that can eat that for like, for like 80 years and be very happy, <laughs> you know, and live a long, balanced life. And yet, you know, um, we're trying to pick on a specific, specific have topic. Have you done special it. diets with your fighters, Joel, or have you had people come in and have you seen a change in performance from going one side to the other? Yeah, well, you know. MMA is one of those sports where the guys train hours on end, right? Sure. And a lot of them, I mean, at least the ones we work with are training twice a day. You know, other athletes train three times a day. Right. So you literally have a guy who's coming in to do his strength conditioning in the morning. He's coming back in to do his skill work. And when you're burning that many calories, the biggest thing, like you're getting back to, is just the basics. If they don't take in enough calories, they don't have full glycogen stores, number one, they're not going to perform. You know, but research also tells us that low glycogen stores chronically are one of those things that signal the brain that something's going wrong. And that's one of the things that's a trigger, you know, can be one of the signals for shifting the body into more of an overtrained state. So first and foremost, it's just getting them to understand the post-workout nutrition, making sure they're getting enough calories in, making sure they're, you know, just getting water. And the biggest thing is just the basics. I mean, to me, I think we spend a lot of times um, discussing diets and super high-end crazy schemes, when the reality is there's so much just at the basic foundational level that needs to be covered and addressed and improved before you ever get to that point. You know, I think we need to take a step back from, um, you know, really going over the top and just get those basics covered. And MMA is a good example of that because right. there's, there's so many guys just not getting those basics covered and they're trying to take creatine and 10 different supplements before they have enough calories, enough carbs in. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and it's the, the thing that I think about when you made the mention of the fighter in terms of the day-to-day -day is that calories is a big component of it, but also you got to get into the macronutrients for the person as the next step because if that person's, so that person's function is wake up, train, consistently on a certain level of effort, rest, train. So the macronutrients they need to be taken in needs to be digested quickly. No, absolutely. So you can see why people choose peanut butter and Gatorade and, and just sugary foods and donuts because it's a fast approach. It's in, it's digested, and then they can go and do their work. So if you, if you prescribe uh, chicken and you know, herb sauce and, and broccoli and, you know, these, and a mm. good sandwich, that's not being you're digested. Making, you're making it how yeah, but that's not being digested. So if someone has that at lunch, number one, it doesn't taste good for an athlete. And number two, their brain says, I'm not gonna take that in fast enough so that I can use it effectively for glycogen replenishment and recovery and things. And Absolutely. we forget about that. So it can't just go the sugar route. You gotta find a middle ground in terms of what that is. And I think you have to get, um, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's tough. Like yeah, it's not, we, it's chocolate have, milk. Is, yeah, you know, maybe we should have Patrick go get us some food. While, <laughs> let's while, test it out. While he's over let's there. test it out. Yeah. yeah, we'll test it out. I'll eat <laughs> the chicken and broccoli. You eat the donuts. And right. then we'll take yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah. And we'll see how well the questions and the answers go based but upon right, that. Right, it, it's, it's, when training, you're only as good as what you can recover from, right? Mm -hmm. And diet into that. There's a huge factor, you know, and you can look and yeah. say, you know, you can take, I've goofed around, not scientifically, obviously, but just played with my training and diet and just seeing my HRV, you know, I wake up and do it and it definitely has a bearing when I, when I add different foods in, yep. you know, and I, I know, know that's, that's for me. So I'm not going to go out and tell people, oh, you should do this because that's my protocol. Yeah, you know but I mean? that's a and good one. Yeah, for, for sure. And it does make sense. I mean, because in, in starting using it, I, I thought that it was just a training piece that we'd see some differences in it. But we see emotional changes or acute, you know, emotional trauma do it. We see uh, just food do it. And then we see training pieces create some changes sure. in it. So people were like, well, I've been off for three days, but this happened. And then we have bigger discussion. And it's like a bad situation at home or oh, yeah. something happened where, it, you know, that has an entire effect on, on the person when they do that. I think um, the, 
one point I want to make, though, based upon the day-to-day -day that does work, though, I think for a broad audience that we can take from this maybe is that that breakfast routine and an end day, maybe a carb loading end day, I'm not even sure what, you carb know, that may be carb back loading. Um, that's one thing that we can control. I think people can control that. You wake up and you get a quality piece in, and then throughout the day you do enough that's required to function. So if it's supplementation, aminos, sugars, whatever the case may be, wrap it until the day is done, and then you can control the evening meal. So if you get two big pieces in, that can start like a good process of total calorie, you know, um, lack of calorie restriction, calorie management, and get enough things in. I think you can have like meat and veggies and and your stuff in the evening and then a quality breakfast and then throughout the day, you know, if they screw up, well, I mean, they're just working off sugar anyway. So it may be something to think about that could be broad for everyone. Yeah, no, they're just, just to wrap things up, you know, you know we talked about supplements earlier, you know, we definitely want to make sure the diet is in check first. We have the foundational pieces, but are there any kind of, you know, core supplements that you do recommend for people? I mean, multi fish oil, that kind of stuff. Are there anything that you guys, you know, kind of recommend across the board that most people should be taking? I was going to say, when you said experts at the beginning, you were referring yeah. to them, not no, me. No, no, no. Yeah, so, no, 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 not me either. No. Yeah. We're just, Washington, I, we're fine. I yeah, take, yeah. I take. Uh, Go to Arizona, you might get arrested. Right. I take or, Joel's or fish or oil. Mexico. Make it, what is it? Bioforce. Fish oil, yeah. Bioforce fish oil. Uh huh. And how's that working for it's you? It's awesome. Multi. It's great. It's second on the course. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, and maybe. I don't take fish oil. Yeah. <laughs> There's the difference. Loser. Loser. <laughs> So is that a no? You guys don't have any basic kind of multi uh, anything? Mine's really detailed um, in answer. It becomes me. very, because um, I'm- Individualized? Yeah, it's very individualized. I'll say that. I'm also very, or highly interested in functional medicine. And I have been um, for a number of years since uh, I've been working with uh, medical doctors and naturopaths in terms of the full terrain. And um, of course, they're heavily based on supplementation um, to fix sick. But I saw lots of pieces within that that could improve people's health that I thought was you know, amazing. So um, I do have a supplement line and we do um, sell supplements based upon what we feel is the best necessary for that person. Mm -hmm. And I think at times there are pieces, even with the fixes, like I mentioned with a good diet, that doesn't help things. So you need to have some things that are thrown in there that can be beneficial for it. Um, not, it's not a disclaimer, but we do have a lot of people go through our medical system in order to create prescriptions for that because I think some of it, even you know, the fish oil conversation, which we won't, you know, maybe it's another time, another topic, but if, if overused or underused, it can be shown as being ineffective. So or it's the right, I've seen it even exactly, before. yeah. So I mean, if you make that, yeah, that membrane work differently, you don't want it to, that may, they may not be so good. So I, I take approach of uh, having it still very individualized, but used quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny, the more, more we get together and talk, the more individualized everything yeah. becomes. And yeah, yeah. is really individualization and not generalization. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna come up with a special program for Howie, right? I thought you were going to say for everybody, and that was going to make me laugh. Well, <laughs> well, no, you know, you're number two, so I mean, that's right. <laughs> you don't need to change anything. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. he's not number one, so. Yeah. No doubt. Well, that's because you're not taking the multi. Exactly. I want to thank you guys again for coming. Uh, Mark, and they, where can everybody find more about uh, the PTC and what At, you guys are up to? Uh, www.resultsperiod1.com. you got to get rid of that period. And that's right? a number one, right? What's that? Is yeah, that number yeah, one? Number one. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you. Who has, who results has, period one. Who has results P1.com? Results P1 .com. Does somebody have that? Uh, you know, I don't RP1. know. Well, I'm having my uh, research team look into that as, <laughs> as we speak right okay. now. They are <laughs> it hard just at happened. it. They're back at the office. And uh, I mean, I that's, how, that's how quick uh, that's I how get on roll. things. Yeah. That's how you absolutely. roll. Absolutely. It's happening right now. Absolutely. I'm taking care of. Oh, I hear in the background. I'm Jack. You have RP1. It's trademarked. Power. Thank you. Thank you. And James, about you? OPTExperience.com. Nice and simple. How we, what, can we find you anywhere? Are you nowhere. Are you right here. Mexico. Mexico. He doesn't leave. Yeah. Mexico. Do you, do you even have a Facebook? No, no Facebook. Facebook. You have Twitter? Really? No Twitter. You, Nothing. I have an email you and you're email? not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you guys can find more videos from us here at eightweeksout.com. And make sure and enter your name and email to stay up to date and get the latest videos. We'll, of course, be back next week with another great episode. And in the meantime, check us out, twitter.com slash Joel Jameson or facebook.com slash eightweeksout. And we'll see you again next episode.